We continue now with 2 Thessalonians. And the opening question for this would be, is there a continuation from the first book? In other words, when we read, for instance, 1 and 2 Corinthians, there's a, a strong progression between the two. Actually, you really need to read 2 Corinthians in light of 1 Corinthians and read them together. So is there anything like that? And in particular, think about some of the themes that we talked about with 1 Thessalonians. We notice that it's very positive, commending. Paul comes to them in complete contrast to, let's say, his approach in 1 Corinthians or Galatians. And instead of then concern about them or confronting them about a very difficult issue, Paul comes to them very much rejoicing and grateful. You have flourished, you have been faithful, and so I rejoice every time I give thought to you. I give thanks to the Lord for your response to him. Well, that's, that's a very encouraging tone. We also noticed at the end of 1 Thessalonians, or actually all the way throughout, this theme of increasing or going further. And so the notion that Paul writes to them and says, yes, I rejoice in how you have responded, but I, I admonish you, flourish even more, grow even more, continue, follow after these things even more than you already have. Does that continue? Did they do it? Or did they fall away? Or what happened in terms of a progression between the two books? And the answer for starters is, again, very encouraging. Starting out in chapter 1, we are bound to give thanks or to thank God always for you, brethren, because, and here I want you to notice, remember the growth or go further or increase more, that concept? Well, watch this. Your faith does grow exceedingly. The charity of every one of you toward each other does abound. And so if the, the question is, did they continue or did they fall away? They did exactly what he admonished them to do. They flourished even more in their faith. But here, that's going to introduce verse 4, a theme that now is very significant in the book. And that is the concept of persecutions, tribulations, enduring. It's the recognition now that yes, they flourished, but this actually came about in the context of suffering. And suffering is going to be a huge theme across this book. So you see in the words we just read, but let's keep on going, verse 5, this is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. God will recompense tribulation to those that trouble or persecute you, and to you who are the persecuted, you will rest with us when Jesus will be revealed. And finally, in chapter 3, that you may be delivered, or excuse me, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. It's a very strong sense here that this is not just random persecution, or random suffering as though, okay, someone has a sickness or someone's in some trouble, but it is personalized. It's people that are persecuting and that actually points to my second theme closely related to that, that this is connected to evil people. And let's just notice that theme again here. Notice it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to those that trouble you. People are troubling or persecuting them. God will bring vengeance on them that know not God. So this is individuals that are persecuting them. People that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, those people shall be punished with everlasting fire. And chapter two is gonna connect this in with an additional theme, which is something we'll talk about in a bit, but the man of sin, the antichrist, a future wicked person. Of course, what we saw earlier, unreasonable and wicked men. All of that connects down to something deeper and darker. And the darker reality now is that there's something satanic standing behind all of this. That actually it's not just unreasonable and wicked men, but it is a wicked spirit. And that's going to point further to Satan and the Antichrist. Here we have those themes. The one who's coming is after the working of Satan. The evil that will come in the future. 
the future day that will come, the day of the Lord that will come, with the man of sin, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist predicted, like in Daniel 9, and predicted again in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation, the one who will destroy, the one who will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, the one that, as God, proclaiming himself as God, will sit in the temple of God, showing himself as if he's God. And keeping on going, we see the whole framework here in, in terms of future eschatological destruction and, and chaos. So then the wicked will be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And the working of Satan with, will come with all power and signs and lying wonders. And he will deceive with unrighteousness those that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. It's a very strong theme across 2 Thessalonians. In fact, I could put this in terms that you would just see as a highlight. So I'm, I'm going to show you here now highlighting I did across the book of 2 Thessalonians. I want you to watch for two colors. You're going to see the color orange, and that's highlighting believers. Okay, so how do believers survive or how do they function within all of these realities? And you're going to see another color, blue, and that's the persecutors. I just want you to notice the pattern of how these work out. So as I walk through the book, you see the orange here, a very strong emphasis at the beginning on the believers and their faithfulness. Okay, you see a little bit of blue, but you come to chapter two and that really shifts. And now we have a strong emphasis on the antichrist or the persecutors or Satan. And moving into the final chapter, an additional theme you'll notice, the red, which we will return to in just a little bit. So what's going on with that? And here's the way I would like to explain or recognize that pattern. I think core to 2 Thessalonians is this strong contrast between believers and unbelievers. But it's a strong contrast not just between the two in theory or in abstract, but in respect to the future. Let me show you what I mean. So I put this in graphic terms. And I start out here, I just put a, a bar across believers on one side, unbelievers on the other side. Okay, that's the fundamental contrast between the two. And you can see at the top of the screen or the top of the graphic that you have believers characterized by faith, but also by suffering. So they're putting their faith in God, that what, that's what makes them believers. And the result of that is actually that they suffer more. You go across to the other side, and on the other side, unbelievers reject the truth and they deceive connected to that or as proof of that, they persecute the true believers. And those two parallel, distinguish these two groups of people absolutely and entirely. These two groups of people are utterly distinct because of this difference. But I think the argument of 1 Thessalonians is to take those realities, which is a very common New Testament idea, and to connect those themes into the future, or yes, even into the paradigmatic or the ultimate example of this contrast. And what that contrast is, the ultimate example, is the contrast now between Jesus Christ and the man of lawlessness. Or let me say this another way. If you take the theme of believers, they're trusting, they're following God, and yet they suffer for it. And over here, unbelievers, they're, they're morally broken, and yet as a result of that, they are in control, and they seem to be prospering. Okay, that basic dynamic. You can just run that forward all of the way into the future. And what you will find in terms of the future, you can do a kind of a parallel with that, with Christ and Christ's followers and the man of lawlessness. In other words, it, it's not that persecution for the Thessalonian believers is a temporary state or an odd, um, an exception, something unprecedented and not to be repeated. But the argument of 2 Thessalonians goes, oh, this is actually common and this will continue all the way to the end. So that this is just going to increase and increase and increase to a climactic expression in the end times. And that takes me to point out how much 2 Thessalonians talks about eschatology. In, in fact, really, 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians, it's recognized, the two books together, are some of the strongest indications we have or information that we have about eschatology outside of 
some of the quote eschatological books. So certainly Revelation, Daniel, and a significant portion of Matthew. But within the rest of the New Testament epistles, among the Pauline epistles, there's no question I'm getting the most information about eschatology in these two books. And a lot of discussion specifically about Jesus Christ's return. Let me show you some of the passages, I won't even show you all, but some of the passages that go this kind of direction, and it's quite constant throughout the book. So chapter one, verse seven, Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. He will take vengeance on them that know God. They will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power when he will come. Okay, I mean, you have it quite explicitly when he will come when Jesus will be revealed, and what he will do in the process. If you go down to chapter 2, you have the same notion continuing on. It's very obvious that the discussion here is the day of the Lord coming. And in fact, there are some significant resonances between the two books in chapter, or 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians as well. There was significant concern, apparently, for these believers that maybe somehow they missed the day of the Lord or they missed the coming of Christ. And so Paul, again, is coming back around and admonishing them again about this thing. Maybe that's a pastoral reminder that even really good, faithful people can be confused theologically, and sometimes they need to be taught and taught and taught. I mean, these are good people, taught and taught and taught and taught. And even though he's commending them, he has to really kind of repeat the teaching again to, to make this very, very clear. In any case, what I, I want to wonder, or what I want to ask here is what's the connection? Okay, I see persecution. You could see maybe Paul going the direction of 1 Peter or something, right? I mean, there, there is other pastoral advice that could be given, or you could go the direction of Revelation, say, okay, endure and continue to the end, or something along those lines. But why the eschatological connection? Why is that concept of eschatology so strong and so repeated in this book? Very obviously so. And I think the argument of it goes, live life now in the midst of suffering in light of the eschatological reality, the future reality of Jesus Christ's return, because that will change everything. When Jesus returns, everything about your situation will change. Let me show you what I mean. So I told you earlier this kind of paradigm, believers, unbelievers, but Jesus Christ is returning. And, and in the future, you're going to see this kind of persecution or this tension raised to the highest level, the ultimate expression of it, when there's someone satanic who's actually in charge of the world, and yes, of course, persecuting every believer. But it doesn't just stay there. Notice the arrows in the background, an absolute transformation. And what that means is, in the end, those who were persecuting and the persecutors will be exchanged here by this, the reality of this coming exchange, they will now face suffering. Those who are now suffering will experience relief. Everything will be transformed or everything will be flipped around so that the person now who suffers is the person who's blessed. The person now who persecutes will be facing vengeance from God. And that's exactly the concept or exactly the link he made, remember, in chapter 1. Just notice again the argument of this. When Jesus Christ returns, he will take vengeance on those that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those people will be punished with everlasting destruction. Everything will be changed. Everything will be transformed. And this now then gives us a final set of instructions. I could talk about several things here. I could talk about the theme of the gospel, which is a major theme in several places. Here you see the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, or our gospel. I could talk about the truth, which is a, another repeated idea, our testimony. Here is the issue of a delusion. They will believe a lie because they did not believe the truth. In other words, if you stop believing the truth, eventually you are given over and completely are deceived. Or here, belief in the truth called unto our gospel, so stand fast, hold the traditions by word or our epistle. In other words, part of the advice that Paul can give here is, 
you have received truth, continue in that truth. And a final major idea here is endurance. So just watch for the concept that you endure through tribulations, that you continue and walk in this calling that you have, even in the midst of your suffering and your sorrow. Hold fast, stand fast, hold the traditions, establish you in every good work. And continuing on, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and the patient waiting for Christ. Be not weary. And the concept of that goes, part of the answer to persecution is to wait and be patient and trust the Lord. But there is a final concept I want to talk about in 2 Thessalonians, just to integrate all of these themes. I mentioned it before. Let's just recall the contrast again. You're going to pay it. You'll, you'll see the colors that I talked about earlier. So I talked about the color orange in terms of brothers, Christian brothers. And that gives way in chapter 2 to the blue. Now we're talking about the persecutors or Satan or Antichrist and how they are causing suffering. But there's a final pattern in chapter 3 that's brothers. And chapter 3 is a very interesting instruction because in chapter 3, noticing the pattern of the pink here, in chapter 3, it's shifting over to kind of another category, a Christian brother who's legitimately a brother, but is being disobedient or who's being unfaithful. A specific context, it's a person who's not working, and so he's going to say that this person is walking in a disorderly way, meaning they are trying probably to depend upon other people instead of working themselves. They're walking disorderly and not la they're being lazy instead of laboring for themselves. And so he just continues to say, these people we command and exhort that they work, that they eat their own bread, and so forth. But my, my question here goes, how does that relate to everything else? What's the connection between this and the rest of the book, or how this all fits together? And I would want you to notice one pattern in verse 15 that I think is striking. Do not count this person as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. A person who, as I'm said, is a believer and they are in some ways faithful, but in other ways they're failing, specifically by being lazy and not contributing to the people around them. That person's not an enemy, he's a brother. Why? What, how does this relate to everything else we've talked about? And I think this is a, a, an exceedingly helpful concept in 2 Thessalonians and for our entire New Testament theology in this framework. Think back again to the diagram where we have kind of an absolute division between believers and unbelievers. And the contrast is total. A person who is a believer kind of on God's side and a person who's an unbeliever uh, on Satan's side and the division just complete. I think the idea of this theme is to say, then let's recognize a, a kind of liminal space, an area in between with the recognition that we have people sometimes who live in ways that are not fitting of believers, but they have the confession of believers and they probably are believers, but but they're not being faithful as believers. And that's not to say that it gives anyone an excuse. Okay, go and inhabit that space. You can, you can go be a halfway believer. You don't want to be in that space. But I think the thing that's interesting here is just that the New Testament itself, even though we have a strong emphasis on perseverance and that true believers will live faithfully, the New Testament itself helpfully recognizes that there are places and cases where the line gets blurry, frustratingly blurry. And the book gives us a little bit of a way of talking through that or a way of recognizing and knowing how to deal with it. And yet it's quite clear as the book continues that this is not a place that anyone should be willing to inhabit. In fact, notice here, such a person, note him, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. And the final ending here, I think, is an, a benediction addressed really to the faithful. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You don't want to be part of the liminal space, the in-between space. Well, is he a believer or not? Hard to tell. Who wants to be there? To finish out then 2 Thessalonians and our response to it, as you and I face various challenges, as you and I work through what in some cases is going to be suffering or persecution, I think 2 Thessalonians gives us a helpful pointer. There is an answer. 
there is a place to turn. And our hope goes further to specifically the return of Jesus Christ, to have hope. He's coming. He will return. That return will bring a total reversal of everything. And so the realities that seem so real right now, they're not. They're temporary. These things will be transformed. And the book of 2 Thessalonians encourages us, admonishes us, continue on with the confidence that Jesus Christ will return and make things right. In the meantime, the argument goes, continue, persevere, be strong until Jesus Christ returns. And by his grace, may you and I take that, live it out, and truly incarnate or become all that 2 Thessalonians is charging us to do.